everybody. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Annie and Kate. Tonight, uh, our, oh, first of all, hello, Annie. Hello, how are you? And our guest is the lovely Yvonne Adele. And over to you to introduce Annie. Uh, it's always lovely when we get to invite a friend on, isn't it? Um, and hey, this is the other part that I love about this podcast, because I've got Yvonne's um, bio in front of me. I'm reading it going, I did not know that. <laughs> So I'm going to read it out, but I'm obviously going to ad lib as I go through going, huh, who knew? Um, so Yvonne actually began her career at Microsoft here in Australia. Didn't know that. Um, so as most of the folks probably know on the pod, I've, I've worked for Microsoft for about three years now. Um, and you held some roles over in the UK as well as over in the US doing tech support and education teams. Uh, then armed with all of that wealth of knowledge and experience, you came home and on a mission to help Aussies learn to love tech. And this bit I did know, um, which was that you invented the Miss Megabyte persona, which is awesome, uh, which led to a really quite kind of national media profile at the time and best-selling books. Um, and then this national profile led to invitations from corporate events and then working really closely with event teams and corporate leaders. Um, Yvonne naturally kind of drifted into that business and, and of the diverse, rich and abundance of that in terms of, um, I know you do a lot of emceeing of events and that's actually how we first met because you emceed an event for us for Code Club um, back in the day. So it's great to have you on the on the podcast, Yvonne. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy that you asked me. It's so great to see you and to hear you both. Oh, it's lovely. So I, I actually remember when you were at Microsoft because uh, I'm old. And remember all these things. Sorry, <laughs> Me out. too. She's really not that old, everyone. Really old. <laughs> yeah. So, so now we're just going to ask our icebreaker questions, and I'm going to let Annie go first. All right. If you could go back and tell your younger self one thing, what piece of advice would you go back and tell yourself? You choose boys. Do not wait to be chosen. Ooh, that's a good one. We've had similar answers from other women on the pod saying things like, you yeah, choose your partner wisely. And um, another one of the women on the podcast said something along the lines of, you be careful who you choose because the consequences of that decision aren't just about your love life and yeah, perhaps the family you have, but also about the finances and how that may unravel later on down the line. So I like that answer. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Does that come from a specific experience, Yvonne, or is that just... Uh, I've had a late in life feminist awakening, I guess, in the last sort of six years, I suppose. I'm 52 now. I know I don't look it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Um, uh, that's I, I'm going to fully credit that to Clementine Ford, actually. Uh, Clem's books awakened me to th give me permission to be angry about the way that I have allowed myself to be treated by men over the years and realize, you know, really, I wish I could go back and have given that book to my teenage self. Not that book, all of her books, Fight Like a Girl and Boys Will Be Boys. Um, you know, I... I I, I had a very traditional teenage hood in in um, a little country town in Port Hedland in the northwest of Western Australia, where the boys just worked on their cars and the girls just waited to be chosen. And, you know, that was back in the day was the thing, like you, you get chosen and if you're lucky, you'll get the ring and all that sort of rubbish. And, you know, I'm, I'm on my second marriage now and we've just clicked over 20 years, which is pretty good. So I did get it right this time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I do think that in, in, in understanding and giving my, myself permission to be angry about the way that I've been treated in the past has really made me realise. And, and I've got two daughters and I've, I've instilled this in them and my son also. Yes. Boys need to be feminists too. Yes, they sure do. They need right. feminist dads too, though. Yes, and we luckily do have one of those in our house. <laughs> well done. Yes. You could choose well. Well, I mean, look, I, I shouldn't make it sound so easy because honestly, he is not married to the same woman now as he married. And we, we have had counselling and therapy and we have had some very hard times 
in you know me grabbing him by the horns and dragging him through to the new way and um you know to to his credit he eventually got there with open arms and you know but, but, but did fight in the beginning because he wanted that traditional um coupledom that that we both were you know 22 years ago when we met i was very happy for the man to be the authority and the patriarch of the family and all that sort of stuff you know and it, it, he he sort of had to suck it up or get out and and there were times where i did say that i said this is who i really am like i had you know some like i had a psychotic break to be really honest and went through this whole Jungian therapy situation where I reintegrated all the parts of myself that I was ignoring, you know, and to become my real self, like this sort of five, six years ago. And so, yeah, he, he wasn't, he had to decide if he wanted to be married to that new one. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really good. It's been incredible for us and I'm really proud of us actually now. Should be by the sounds of that's a lot of change, but also at the same point, it's almost like a rediscovery of not just yourself, but then realizing that the relationship needed to move on with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a very Jungian story too, you know, moving towards becoming more whole as, as a person and as a couple. I love that. That's it. And that's the thing. And I actually talk about this in my motivational speeches sometimes about what the midlife crisis is, you know, that we go through life chucking all the parts of ourselves that we are told are not good enough or that should be quiet or that should be smaller, chucking them all into that bag on the back of our back and we carrying our, carrying it around with us. And around the age of 40, this these other bits of ourselves start tapping you on the back of the head and going, I'm still here, I'm still you, mm. you know, and you have to really reintroduce those parts of, of yourself and, and integrate and become the real you <laughs> if, i mean that that sounds almost like it's part of it you, you get to a stage where you've got no more fucks to give so you just become yourself yeah that's it that's exactly right and 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 it sometimes it takes a rock bottom moment to get there because you know like this psychotic break for me involved my brain just not working one day it just stopped working and it was just like cannot compute cannot process computer says no it was really odd when I'm like this mile a minute do a thousand things at once kind of person and it really came from always trying to do whatever anyone needed and realizing that I was out of units to give other people I had no units left for me and that that sort of was my moment where I had to stop doing everything including working and I really just took three months to rebuild my brain <laughs> yeah that sounds fascinating that that's that's what I call hitting the wall yeah it hit, happens to me occasionally where I, I do so much stuff and then sometimes I just can't do anything and I just have to lie down for a while yeah and that's the thing you have to honor it you have to honor it and, and instead of go what is this what am I feeling this is no good you have to go oh hello hello black dog hello dark moment I will let you process your way through me and I'll just go with it mm. It's, it's interesting. So, Annie, what, what are you drinking? What, have you got a drink? I haven't asked your question yet, Kate. I know, but I'm just doing the drinks thing first. Oh, okay, cool. Um, well, that's fair enough. Um, we, Kate always tries to go out of process, Yvonne. It always throws... <laughs> I am very non-linear. I like a bit of chaos. Um, I have some uh, Margaret, Rav Margaret River uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a 2007 drop. It's all right. It's not bad. It'll do. You give it. How many stars are you giving it out of five? Out of five, I'll give it. I'll give it a solid three and a half. Oh, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Possible. Mine. I don't have the bottle, but because no, I have drank all the bottle. This is the last glass, uh, but not today. Um, it's a Cote de Rhone because <laughs> you know how I love French wines. <laughs> well, it sounds fancy. Do you have a beverage of any description? Um, about? I. I'm, I don't want to hold it up because Annie will be mad because I've, I've got a takeaway coffee cup. Sorry, Annie, don't be mad. <laughs> I didn't have my keep cup with me today, but we have the largest concentration of Persian people in our city of Manningham in all of Australia. Mm -hmm. And we have such a beautiful Persian culture here, a Persian cafes and restaurants and neighbors, and it's just fabulous. And there's a cafe, my favorite cafe is called the Tea Tent, and they do a turmeric latte 
but I get it as a dirty turmeric latte, which means that it has a shot of coffee in it. As, yeah, a shot of coffee in it. So this is a turmeric latte with honey and cardamom and turmeric and all sorts of other spices with a shot of coffee. Very. I don't drink alcohol. That's fine. We, we, yeah. We've had plenty, plenty of folks on here and, and many times where we haven't drunk either. Yeah. Just because it's the morning and that would be weird. <laughs> yeah. So Kate, what's your question? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask my question. I hardly ever ask this one. So can you tell us about your favourite tool? And it could be any kind of tool. It doesn't have to be like a, a power tool or yeah. a wrench or anything. Some tool that you use all the time and that you love. It's going to have to be a toss up between two. Is that all right? Mm. I'm not going to say it's all yeah, right. Yeah, we I'm don't, we're right. not I'm just making you. binary choices. <laughs> uh, the quick unpick, you know, the quick unpick little tool that you can unpick seams and, and stitches mm. with. Yes. Oh my God, that, that, I have one of those in, in uh, every okay. room. And also, uh, you know, it, it's called, I can't remember what it's called, a trolley saver, I think it's called, but it's um, something that hangs off your key ring that you can use to put in the oh, coin yeah. slot on the yeah. trolleys. Yeah, that, yeah. that is. I've a, got a, one of those in my bag that I never remember I have when I'm at the supermarket. The one that I have, it's like, um, it's, it's rounded on the edge and you can use it to um, push through and back out of the coin thing. So you don't have to leave it in there. It's very oh, good. Wow. You can go and unlock all the trolleys if you want. <laughs> That's a, that sounds like what I need. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you the link. <laughs> I love little tricks and tips like that. The, the sort of the time-saving devices that you never knew you needed. Yeah. Um, one that I, I gave to Kate quite recently was just an app that you can put on your phone so you can cook eggs. Oh, yeah. And she's just like, I always overcook them. And now, now I don't have to. Are you talking about boiled eggs? Because I've got a good yeah. trick to them too. Well, see, I subscribe to the New York Times cooking app and they have done this worldwide scouring search of how to make the best boiled eggs. And since that, well, maybe a year and a half, I've been making them this way, but you steam them. Are yours being steamed? So you put the Ooh. steamer basket inside the saucepan. And when you hear the water bubbling under the steamer basket, you put in however many eggs you want, put the lid on, and six minutes is the perfect dippy boiled egg, and 11 minutes is the perfect hard boiled egg. And that wow. is, yeah, that's my trick. Got to have a dippy egg, I'm sorry. Yes, I love the dippy eggs too, I but, I, but I put in the hard boiled eggs in the fridge to have, you know, daily that's after that. Different. That's different. Dippy egg and soldiers all the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the ultimate breakfast for me. With Vegemite too. <laughs> Well, I'd obviously go Marmite, but you know. Of course, of course. Not Promite? God, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I've offended Annie now. We're done. Uh, I can, I I can remember just... the first time I tried Marmite. My grandfather made me try it when I was very small. And I remember going, this is not Vegemite. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of sweet, isn't it? Yeah. It, and it's, it's just got a very different texture. Yeah. Um, they, well, one of the things I first did, my mum first came over, it was probably about seven years ago now to Oz. And we did this taste test because she loves Marmite. We did this taste test and she's like, I'll pick out the Vegemite. Nope, really didn't. Preferred the Vegemite. Like, oh, get wow. Out. That's Got interesting. Because the texture is so different. Well, I think I, she was blindfolded. So, you know. Fair but, enough. Yeah, I wasn't pleased. <laughs> it probably wasn't like a 20 year old jar of Vegemite like we all have in our cupboards in Australia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it never goes off that stuff. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to move on to um, some slightly less jovial questions because, you know, otherwise we would literally just be here, here for hours. Um, what started you off in your career in tech, Yvonne? Oh, okay. So my mum was the typing teacher in the local primary school in Port Hedland. And so she brought home the Commodore 64 from typing class. And that was my first foray into touching a computer. So, you know, that was back in the days where, you know, you, you would type in line 10, Yvonne, line 20, go to 10. Mm -hmm. And then you, your name would just keep scrolling until you pressed escape or something. And you'd be like, I'm on TV. <laughs> <It's just laughs> so, so that was my first, um, you know, foray into computing. And then I just discovered that I was obsessed and I had a knack for, you know, coding and computing and, and gaming and all that stuff. And that's when you used to play Pong, you know, boop, boop, yep. boop. And um, 
So then I, I took any sort of computing class that I could find and I read all the books I could get. And then I, because I was so interested in pro productivity tools, I suppose is the right way to put it, that um, back then there was, you know, seven or eight different word processing. There was DeckMate, WordMate, DigiMate, Microsoft Word. There was all these different, you know, word processing platforms and I knew them all. And so when I moved out of home and I moved to Sydney, I went to a temp agency and did my typing test and did my like proficiency and computers test. And it was like, whoa, she, we could put her into any company that needs help. And she knows whatever system they've got because everyone would have a different thing. So I became this sort of star admin temp person. And then whenever I would get stuck uh, on say Microsoft Word, I'd call the help desk. And back then it was free and easy to get through to the Microsoft help desk, you know, in Sydney back in 1980. There were actual people that you could find. That actual people. There were six people that worked in tech support and they would just answer the calls and <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, and whenever they didn't know the answer, I would basically like down tools and try and find the answer so I could call Microsoft back and give them the answer. <laughs> And that's what I did. And so I got a bad reputation amongst the tech support staff at Microsoft because I was like, oh, she's calling again. <laughs> anyway, so one day someone... Back, would that be back when there wasn't caller ID? So yeah, they exactly. Pick up the phone yes. Go, Hello, yes. Microsoft help us. Yes. Oh, Ron Adele. Oh. <laughs> that's right. So, um, yeah, someone, one of my mates in Sydney saw an ad in the paper for, you know, they were looking for a tech support person at Microsoft and it was more than one person sort of circled the ad in the paper and sent it to me and said, you know, you've got to go for this job. So I went for the job and I was in, I did like two interviews. And as I found out later after I got the job, apparently I was sitting in the office, you know, being interviewed by the tech support team lead there. And there was a glass wall behind me with the tech support people just apparently standing there going, not her, <laughs> any of her. But that, that's mean because, you know, someone's so keen really should get the job. Anyway, I got the job and, um, and Bill Gates came for the very first time to Australia. It was so funny. And we took him on a Harbour cruise in Sydney, might've been like 89 or something like that. And, um, you know, and I remember him, uh, we were all talking to him and I said to him, what do you do in your spare time? And he said, I, we, I read quantum physics manuals. And I was like, conversation over. <laughs> And, he, and then I don't know I was talking so much he said let me guess PSS product support services tech support and I was like yes um so that was my you know claim to fame with Bill Gates but I sort of found that you know there wasn't because I wasn't interested in sales or analytics or any any other part of the business I was only interested in tech there wasn't really anywhere for me to move inside the business so I asked to be seconded to another country tried to go for America. It was too hard and eventually got seconded to, um, the UK. So I was in Wokingham and, um, yeah, worked there for, for ages. And I was, uh, when I came back to Australia, I was the very first ever Microsoft DOS certified professional <laughs> in Australia. Do you, get a, do you get a certificate for that? I have a badge. I should have got it ready. Actually. I do have a badge. <laughs> uh, so funny a badge t-shirt, you know, all that stuff. But, um, yeah, so when I came back to Australia, there, there were no places to go in tech support other than train the trainer sort of stuff. So I started my own consultancy called Misinformed. <laughs> and I was, you know, doing consulting and teaching and training and all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, that's when I came up with the idea of Miss Megabyte. Well, tell, tell us about Miss Megabyte. A lot, a lot of people won't, won't know about Miss Megabyte. So Yeah, so uh, I, around... 1996-ish, my nickname amongst my friends was Megabytes because I was a computer nerd and uh, I, I just would be like, yeah, okay, Megabytes, is Megabytes coming? You know, that sort of thing. And so I asked my graphic designer boyfriend at the time, like, you know, cre can you create like a caricature of me, like a cartoon version of me? And he, and because I've always had this red hair and it's always been sort of a bit wild. And this Miss Megabyte character had this crazy hair, but off each strand of hair, there would be a mouse or a keyboard or a book or a floppy disk or something like that, you know? So we created this character 
And then, you know, I was doing consulting and training as Yvonne, but that was my logo. And then uh, I was watching Burke's Backyard, which was kind of like, you know, the living room, like a lifestyle show where there was an expert and a vet and a money person and, you know, a home renovation person and a garden person, but there was no tech person anywhere in any magazine, on any TV show, on any radio, anything, anywhere. And this was in 1995, 96. And that's when I just went, whoa, I have to be the computer person on these lifestyle shows, you know? So I made a video, a VHS tape with my, my mate and we got it copied, you know, 10 times and we sent it to all the TV networks and it was just like, I'll just wait for the phone to ring and I'll get on TV. <laughs> it was really that easy. Um, so then I started calling and it, it just, I couldn't get anywhere. Everyone we spoke to said that, it was too boring. Computers were boring and they were just a big gray, ugly box on the desk and or beige even. And then I was reading uh, Women's Day or Women's Weekly or one of those one day. And I realized all that people off that TV show, the gardener and the vet and the money person and the home renovation, they all had articles in the magazine. So I started writing a Miss Megabyte article as it would look in the magazine and pasting it back in and sending the magazine back to Women's Weekly, Women's Day, New Idea, and all the magazines. And I did it for about four or five months before Clio Magazine, uh, Paula Joy, who was at Clio Magazine at the time, called me and said, like, you know, how do I stop you sending these magazines back to us? <laughs> I said, you just have to have a 10 minute meeting with me. I said, I'm going to be in Sydney in two days, which I wasn't, but like I spent a thousand dollars on the plane fare to go there. And, um, and yeah, we had the meeting and, and my very first article in a magazine as Miss Megabyte was a column in Clio magazine called How to Find Pictures of Brad Pitt on the Internet. <laughs> that is a hell of a claim to fame. <laughs> and then I sort of graduated from that to a double page spread in Women's Weekly, which was the monthly magazine run by Nene King. And that was, you know, how to learn enough about computers to be able to support your children while they're using computers for school and all that. So it was how to buy a PC, how to use a PC. And that was more sort of uh, wholesome, I suppose, and, and, you know, back to basics. And that's where it all took off because then the TV networks were like, oh, you're that person who does the article in the magazine. And so that was that strategy ended up working. So I got on Kerry Ann's morning show and Bert's morning show and, then I got a regular gig on the Today Show, which was really where it all took off because I was the IT reporter on the Today Show for about five years at 7.40 every Tuesday morning. Yeah. So what I love about that is, because I speak to a lot of female founders, particularly women founders who are struggling with how to build their profile and they don't understand or, or, or particularly actually quite a lot of founders, it doesn't matter whether you're male, female, you know, any gender whatsoever, the, there's a lot of founders when they first start their companies that they don't realize that they need to invest in their own profile just as much as they need to invest in the company's profile. And if you want to be you know, sort of renowned as an expert in your field, you don't just build the product. You have to also be you know, the thought leader, the expert, the person with opinions. And so many founders I meet who are like, yeah, I'm not that person. I'm just building the, the tech or I'm just building the product no, 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 no. You, you have to be the whole company. You can't just be one part of it. So was there a part of your brain that just realized that that's how you needed to build out your profile or were you just tenacious and tried every different angle until something worked? Yeah, the second one. <laughs> now I understand what I was doing, uh, but then it was like, what do you mean you said no? Okay, every no is another step to yes. I will get my, you know, it was all that. There are no mistakes, only feedback. I was, you know, I was that positive. I've always been that positive, optimistic person. So it was just like, I will get on television and teach people to stop hating computers. And, you know, that, that was pretty much where it was driven by. But now, I mean, I understand exactly what you're saying about building personal brand and personal profiles. And in fact, that's one of the things that corporates hire me for now. Like I did a, a great program with a whole bunch of female executives at NAB a couple of years back uh, where they realized they did this incredibly detailed survey about um, which one of which of their executives were being chosen for media relations and quotes and speaking engagements and all that sort of stuff. And although one of their values was we see women, 
no women were getting a chance to uh, be put up for these things or putting their hands up for them. So, you know, I did a whole program with them over about a year and a half where we built their ability to um, use their personal brand and, and work out what they personally stood for and which part of their personal values were in alignment with the bank and the bank's values and then start getting them speaking engagements and, and using LinkedIn better and that sort of thing. So yeah, I do understand that strategy side of it much better now. And it sounds to me like you were a really instinctual, instinctive marketer, just doing all of those sensible things that we understand now, but doing it with, with no theoretical basis, but it was really successful. It's fascinating. Well, yeah, I wonder whether, you know, I mean, you make it sound good but I think maybe it's just like maybe it was just being arrogant <laughs> maybe, maybe it was just you know what I mean maybe it was really just being like a bull in a china shop you know like my like my mum says you know you really do pick the day up by the horns and shake the living hell out of it you know and I guess it's just I, I think it's easy when you're you know an extrovert and outgoing and you don't take no for an answer and you know you can't it's hard to crush you I suppose it's it's easy to make it look like you you knew what you were doing and you're being an intuitive marketer but uh, yeah I'm not sure I would credit myself too much with me, me being an intuitive marketer but I like the sound of it <laughs> but but what 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 was driving you to want to be the communicator I just knew that I had a certain knack for helping people understand technology in a way that would make them love it and I I was so frustrated only being able to teach eight to ten people in a room at a time when I was doing training that I I could see that being on tv was going to be the way to help more people love technology and that that was it I wanted to change people's thinking and you, and you were, about you were technology. Re really a big part part of that what would you do now if you were starting at that with that same ambition now, what would you do differently? Well, now with all well, the you know, back back then, and like I said, there was no technology education anywhere. And that the that article in Women's Weekly was the very first article about technology in the history of the magazine, and it was in the 60th birthday edition of the magazine. That double page spread on how to buy a computer, and then it led to TV, radio, book, the best selling book, Conquer Your Computer, and all that. And there, there, that was the very first technology education for consumers in Australia so I am super proud of that and that was god like because, because a, lot of, a lot of people watching what are not old enough to remember like yeah you did not people had no mental map to put a computer on you know there were there was none in my life you know that I didn't have, know anyone that had a pc it was only when I went to work that I saw pcs for the first time that's exactly right. And so back in that time where I started this, that was when Bill Gates was saying a computer in every home on every desk, you know, and that was, that was a wow, way out there blue sky statement to make, you know, there were no laptops, you know, laptops were for, you know, rocket scientists. <laughs> we didn't even have mobile phones and that sort of thing, like make it sound like we're all living in the dark ages, but that's how quick it goes. So you know, what would I do now? Well, I am doing it now because I launched a dress label, which is nothing like anything I've ever done before. And so I am having to, you know, build that brand and my personal brand as a fashion designer from scratch again. So oh, wow. I didn't know this. Tell me more. I did. We had a little conversation over Twitter the other day. With pockets, the remember? The shouting pockets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, the, it's called, it, it's, a, it's my name, it's Yvonne Adel and YvonneAdelStudio.com is the, is the online label. And so what happened was I had a black maxi dress designed for myself that I would be able to wear on stage and, you know, on the plane, the chuck in a suitcase. And um, I have, you know, a, a sort of a quirky, colorful style about me that, you know, if anyone has seen me on stage, you'll see that, you know, it's sort of an engaging, colorful look. And I throw things together to, um, you wouldn't realize that this dress is the same one from day to day to day because of the way that I style it differently. So, so many people have asked me over the years, is that the same dress you were wearing yesterday? Is that the same dress you were wearing this morning? Is that, the, you know, so I realized that I was sort of onto something as far as having created this blank canvas. And then people would say, well, that wouldn't suit me because, 
I've got big boobs. I've got whatever legs. I'm short. I've got a tiny torso. So I worked with a stylist called Jessica Marmotta, who is an incredible stylist, to whittle down the absolute perfect black dress silhouette for each of the five main body shapes that women have, you know, the pear, the apple, the column, etc. And so then I, I designed these six black dresses and had them made and um, made and manufactured and all the fabric and everything sourced in Australia and launched YvonneAdelStudio.com with the, the ultimate black dress for every female body shape. And the whole philosophy is use this black dress as your blank canvas and add you, add everything that you have in your wardrobe. So you know, my um, social media and EDMs and all, all of the media and everything that I do is all about how to style that blank canvas to, to suit you with everything you already have in your, in your wardrobe. So, you know, but well, I was like the only online retailer in the whole of COVID that did not have an uptick in sales because these dresses are perfect for the office and going out, which are the two things nobody was doing <laughs> when, when we had COVID. So it just, Luckily, you know, I, I could shut the show up on this label for three years and come back and, and the designs are so classic. The silhouettes are so classic for the perfect shape for whatever body shape you are that, it, you know, luckily they weren't seasonal and trendy and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, they are classic silhouettes. So now I'm back and I'm going to be doing a couple of different prints and a couple of different colors. And you're going to bring some sort of like stretchy pants in just in case yes. you're going to. Lock well, it's again. funny you should say that. Yes, I have the uh, Palazzo pant, which is going to be named after the fabulous um, chick friend of mine who designed them, Candice. And yeah, so the Palazzo pant, which goes with, you're going to love this, the Zoom top, which is a gorgeous wrap top that you can put on top of anything, pajamas, bra, whatever, to look good for a Zoom meeting in one second. So you, you've finally, because I don't wear dresses, so you know, I was just like, oh, that's all very nice. And if I wore dresses, that would be good. Do I? And I'm assuming they have pockets. Yes, a couple of them do. Yes, but um, there's three wrap dresses that are beautiful jersey kind of fabrics, so they don't lend themselves to yeah, having pockets. Themselves but yeah, there's the the three Ponty dresses do have pockets. Yeah, I'm. Zoom top will have like an elevated lounge pant. (laughs) (laughs) So that's all coming. Yes, I'm going. I'm. I'm waiting for that because that sounds like my style. Well, anyone who's listening, you who's liking the look of the label, if you go to Ivana Doll Studio, you can use the code Boss Lady and you'll save twenty percent. We'll put that. We'll put that in the links um, for the show. So So before we let you go, though, Yvonne, if I so if. We kind of talked about how you you just naturally had that instinct of I need to be you know on TV and talking about computers so that people aren't you know sort of worried or scared or that that becomes something that's um, part of their daily usage. If you were back on TV right now and you had a topic that you would you know your soapbox moment that you wanted to speak about, what would it be? Wow. That's a good one because, you know, when you first started asking that question, I was going to say, oh my God, I would never, ever put myself out there as a, as a, as a celebrity now. There was no social media when I did it before. And so, you know, to find negative comments about myself, I had to really go in the IRL chat rooms and look for them, you know, which which was easy not to do if you're trying to avoid them. Uh, you know, I, I feel terrible for your, you know, your everyday experts now who are, you know, your interior design person or your gardening person or whatever. They just, the haters and the trolls would just put me off. Um, but what would I... Oh, I, I, I really think it would be about being yourself. So, you know, people often say, oh, I'm no good at dot, dot, dot. But, but what I, I, I get, you know, I, I wish I could sort of instill in people is that you don't have to be the best at that to enjoy doing it. So you don't have to be the master chef to enjoy cooking. You know, you don't have to be Yo-Yo Ma to play music. You know, you, you if you get joy from an activity like singing for example I mean the amount of people who accidentally call me Adele like in fact Annie used to do it back back in the beginning the amount of people who accidentally call me Adele and I just say listen you hear me sing you will never call me Adele again as long as you live (laughs) but I love singing and (laughs) and I only have one genre that I sing which is 
gangster rap. So, you know, you hear me in the car singing loud about booties and chicks and hoes and like, I mean, like, it's ridiculous. I cannot sing but I love doing it. I'm not going to stop doing it. You know, it's like when I'm, I'm doing that sort of as a talk, I will say to the audience sometimes like, look, uh, can I have permission to do a little activity with you all? And uh, I'll, 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 I'll say to them, just roll with it. Just do whatever comes naturally. And I'll point to the AV desk and I'll be like, okay, three, two, one. And I'll have them all ready to play YMCA. And so the, the, the music goes, dun, 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 YMCA. And so then I start doing the moves and everyone in the audience just starts doing it. I said, now you're singing and you're dancing and you wouldn't have said, you were a singer or a dancer, like do things that bring you joy, no matter how good you are at them, because they bring you joy. That's it. So that's, that's what I would stand for. That's what I would talk about. Who can be a hater or a troll about that? They, they can, but you know, let's just ignore <laughs> them. Let's ignore them and block them. Uh, because, because one of the things that I've always recognized in you is, is you've always been very authentically yourself. Uh, and, you know, for a very long time, you've just been unashamedly, unashamedly who you are. Um, and I think that's been a real, real strength of yours. Well, I just love that saying, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. That, that is it. That mm -hmm. is it. I love that, you know, and, and I do have my haters. I rub people up the wrong way every day because I'm loud and I'm out there and I'm scary to some people. And that's fine. They're not my people. Like I don't mind, anyone. you know, they're not my people. There's plenty of people that are my people and you naturally find your people, you know? So what, one thing I've learned from all the public speaking that I've done is there are essentially three groups of people that see you. The ones that love you to bits, the ones that hate you, and the ones that are indifferent to you. That's everybody out there. Yeah, and that's their problem. What other people think of you is none of your business. That's yeah. it. That's a saying I really love. I love that, you know, and 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 that's the thing, you know, I, I find sometimes when there are people who have some constructive criticism for you about your speaking, if you listen and listen and listen which is what they should have been doing but if you listen 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 you find out that they are completely and utterly scared shitless of speaking so it's like they've projected all their crap onto you and then I just start gradually gently working with them on ways that they could feel better as a speaker and then all of a sudden they're like oh my god you're amazing I'm like, oh, tick, I want another one <laughs> it's, it's funny <laughs> Yes. So one, one thing I, I want to ask, though, is what's really exciting you about technology? I'm assuming you're still in love with technology now. What, what's really exciting for you? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I love automation. So, you know, a lot of when I hear people getting worried and scared about automation and robots and all this sort of stuff, you know, I, I just think I can't wait. I can't wait for all of it. I want I want as many things to be automated as possible. So any app or any, you know, shortcut or anything that makes tasks more seamless and, and quicker to do, great. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for automation and, you know, I'm loving all that stuff that's coming. You know, and people worry about robots. I think, you know, you ask them what they mean. What do you mean when you're worried about robots? Well, robots are going to take the jobs, but they're only going to take the jobs that we don't want to do. It's like, you know, they're going to, leave us more time to do the things we do want to do and they're not actually robots like exterminate <laughs> I went to the comedy festival we've got the comedy festival in Melbourne at the moment and Jeff Green is an older comedian he's so funny he said it's so funny that um you know when you go to buy the comedy show tickets you have to um where it says he goes where it says you've got to prove you're not a robot and it brings up all the pictures he goes oh, I've got to go and get my other glasses and put them on to see is which one's the zebra crossing and this and that and he goes Look, I wouldn't mind if robots bought tickets to the show what are they going to do sit in the front row going exterminate <laughs> he goes if they're buying tickets let them come <laughs> I hate those things where you've got to pick everything out because I'm getting to that age where I should probably get some glasses and I can't pass <laughs> but is very hard it, is it a traffic sign is it a bus and they're usually american signs as well so then yeah or is it a hill it's like is that a hill or is it a mound i don't know yeah, <laughs> like, I can't work it out. yeah they're silly aren't they very silly 
it, it is it is very silly. But but I'm the thing with the robots that I find fascinating is that you know the job there's going to be new jobs. So all the boring stuff. There used to be people who answered the phone at Telstra or whatever, and now you get a robot that does that. So you know, but there are new emerging jobs. There yeah. the job I do now didn't exist when I left high school. I could there was no way I could train for it. So there will be new jobs. Yes, and someone needs to program the robots, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, my, my job certainly didn't exist when I you know, sort of popped out of university. And in fact, it only really happened about 10 years into my career. So there's, there's and I think that's the other part of this, which I think is really interesting, is you know, any kid coming out of university right now is like, you are in for a whole roller coaster ride where you can't predict what's going to happen. And that concept of, you know, being a, uh, you've got to continuously be open to learning and new opportunities and there is no linear career path anymore. I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's what I like about this whole credentialing thing, you know, with blockchain and everything is that you just, you know, as my kids now, I mean, my youngest is just about to turn 16 and I've got a 19 year old and my oldest daughter, 27, who made me a grandma five months ago. Oh, um, uh, oh little, he's so cute. I have him on Fridays. He's so super cute, little Fletcher. Um, but yeah, my, my, kid who's the, the last one in school, my, my son, you know, he'll be doing that credentialing thing where you just sort of pick a portfolio of subjects that aren't necessarily related to a degree and, you know, just pick your passions. And that's going to be an incredible way to go into the future, I think. Couldn't agree more. Yep. Yes. And well, let's hope they don't, you know, automate the whole sort of marriage thing because you know I became a marriage celebrant too a few years ago so I, I I love doing that on the weekends I don't need that to be automated that's fun I don't think you can automate love yet <laughs> possibly, well, possibly not even marriage yeah exactly <laughs> anyway we're, our time is up thank you so much Yvonne lovely to see you thank you Annie it was really good to see you. My Bye, pleasure. Everybody. Thank you so much. I, you know, we could go for four hours, I know, but I really appreciate you guys having a chat with me. Thank you so much. It's lovely. Bye. Sister.